another episode of Don't Shit on the Bus. What up, Neil? Hi, Adam. How are you? Good. Happy day. Today is just a regular day. It's not Valentine's Day or anything. Yeah, it's not Valentine's Day at all. All right. Well, since it's not Valentine's Day, I think we should talk to Charlie Bybee because he is an amazing monitor tech that we both have had the pleasure of touring with, and he's amazing at his job. Yeah, he's a great dude. We've both known him for... Well, I've actually known of him for a long time, but I really got to know him when I was on Truth of Day, I remember, and he's doing his thing, and he's just another example of somebody who started in a van made his way to a bus and then he tours at pretty high level now he works with five sex to summer one okay rock rise against he worked with the day to remember but he left us in the dust he wanted to go work for those amazing guys in one okay rock yeah they are awesome man that band is good you know when they're home in tokyo they practice every day i can tell because they're amazing yeah band practices every day which i think is awesome yeah maybe i should take note and start doing what they do because i would one day hope to be as good as they are hey man you do your twitch that counts let's practice today we're talking to charlie bybee he gives us some amazing pointers on how you can get started in your local area he has some really good just like easy ways to get practice that we never really thought about so even if you're not interested in being a monitor tech or monitor technician monitor engineer whatever you want to call it he's got a lot of good advice it does it transcends to every spectrum of this whole touring industry and outside of it i feel like i mean i have a lot of interest in audio in general maybe not touring audio but like in a studio or for like adam said working with twitch and stuff like that like he has a lot of good tech tips on uh, how to get better at working with audio in general so yeah he's just a badass he went in deep i will say that some of the stuff was a little bit over my head but i think between me and you we tried to ask questions when we're like hey i kind of know what this is and that means that somebody's listening definitely doesn't know what it is so we tried to ask those questions when it made sense and then you know that's all there is to it it's my favorite part of the di- oh my god it's my favorite part it's nicole and greg the patrons this week welcome nicole and greg i know nicole and greg very well do you no not at all they just sound like names of people that i would know and hopefully after this i will know them better pop on the discord give him a shout greg's name on discord is grego the ego so i think that's kind of funny yeah I, I knew i liked greg anyway give us one of your good send-offs to intro charlie here so hey today we are fortunate enough to talk to our amazing friend charlie bybee who is going Going to give you so much insight into what it means to be a monitor tech, so much insight what it means to get started early if you're interested in audio in any form on today's podcast. I hope you enjoy it as much as Adam and I did. Here we go. Hey. I'm trying to think who knows Charlie longer between you and I, Neil. Uh, you might have actually. I mean, I didn't meet you till Ghost Inside. Yeah, Ghost Inside Canada. No, it was the uh, the European tour with August Burns Red. So that would have been fall. Yeah, it would have been fall 2011. I met Charlie with My Children, My Bride. So you've known him longer. Is that who you were with on that tour? I mean, I did some My Children, My Bride tours, but that was a, definitely a few years before that. So that would be wild if that's true. <laughs> yeah, I have a photo of you with your shirt off, but I didn't know him. I just took photos of him. <laughs> okay, that, see, that, that seems more believable. <laughs> <laughs> It was like a 12 band tour called Scream the Prayer with headliners known as Sleeping Giant and I forget. But it was interesting. I like think three bands dropped off the tour in like the first week. I remember that tour happening and being like, man, how fun would it be to have 12 bands on tour with you and have so many people to hang out with? And then like more business minded people in our, our band were like, yeah, but imagine having to share and pay 12 bands. Yeah. How do they make money? They don't, huh? Those were some of the first tours i did was like scream the prayer summer slaughter all stars just you know taking 10 to 15 bands and the like i mean at its end house of blues is but in the beginning just random venues that you would take four into and you know those were some of the first things that i like tour managed like i remembered like the following years you know as i was like giving people like accounting excel sheets and settlement sheets they were like why, why is there 12 spots here for like payouts and stuff? And it, like, when would you have that many bands? And it, oh, you know, you know, sometimes it happens two, three band bills. <laughs> With our powers combined, we make a tour. We make one third of the Christian Spotify metalcore genre playlist on one tour. Well, remember that festival that was religious? Uh, yeah, Cornerstone. Do you remember that festival? Yes. 100%. The Midwest like religious festival, but it was all the bands that like prior to seeing them play that festival, I had no idea they were religious. They did in Orlando too. The thing in Orlando was always like, man, the one in Illinois is better. And I'm like, well, I'm not driving to Illinois for Jesus. I'm just not, it's not happening. It was like 
some of the first things I ever did was driving out to Cornerstone with like Sleeping Giant or like Impending Doom, thinking that was the rest of what the music world looked like. And you're just, you know, doing two, three day drives to a cornfield in Illinois to watch a bunch of like homeschooled kids go wild. (laughs) And I just thought that's what everything was like. And then, you know, as I grew up, I was like, oh, this is a very unique American experience. (laughs) But it's so badass because it's like, does that stuff happen? I mean, obviously, touring is going to be different when we come back from this. But like, there's going to be fucking people that just don't accept no for an answer. And they're like, we're putting a show on in this cornfield. It's going to be badass. Dave Chappelle's opening. Yeah, it doesn't matter. We're having 737 bands play. If the bands just show up, we got a good turnout for the show. I think that's probably part of the thought process. It has to be. God bless them if it does. I hope it does. Some of our first tours, it was like, hey, man, when we play, will you go out and mosh for us? It's like if you had 12 bands on the tour, you would at least have a full mosh pit every show and you look badass. You had like instigators for the mosh. <laughs> yeah. Can you go do a pit for our show? It's like a traveling pit. I went hard for you yesterday in Denny's. I want you to open it up tonight at the VFW. So wait, Charlie, was that how you started touring? I don't know. What did you do before that? Was there anything music related or did you just go on tour? If you want to get into, you know, my beginning stages. I do. But just for touring. It was um, I grew up in Southern California, you know, going to hardcore shows, which, you know, at that time period was kind of the end of the really, really big, like Christian hardcore rush So it was kind of hard not to get into that kind of music without the Christian element to it. So I was mixed into that scene a lot, tried to play in bands, was unsuccessful, had a friend that had a recording set up like at his house. So then instead of playing in bands, I'm like helping him record my friend's bands, which then ended up in me doing, you know, demos for like Suicide Silence and Death Star, which led me to doing demos for Sleeping Giant. And then as I would record those very terrible demos, I would then go with them to local clubs and either watch someone do sound or try out the next day what I saw some other guy doing. So that was kind of loosely how I got into it. Um, So then when all these Christian bands decided to go on one mega Christian tour, I started going out with them on that. Sign me up. Hey, real quick question just for my own curiosity. How many hometown animosity shows did you go to? At least 10. Yes. You know I, mean? least I love 10. that band. So you would say from the beginning, this has always been a hustle. Like you, it wasn't like I got hired by a band. Now I'm on tour. It was like, I want to be involved with music. I love going to shows. I love hanging out with my friends that are all into music. And you were like, however I can get in. That's what I'm in. That's what I'm about. I'm going to do it. Yeah. I mean, and it, it wasn't really like the motivation was to like do sound or record bands, but it was more just, you know, trying to find some way to be involved in, you know, what my friends were doing and what I was interested in. You know, it's like you're going to shows and then all your friends start, you know, playing in shows, putting on shows. So you kind of figure out something you can do and then you see as far as you can take it. So, you know, definitely the first two, three years of doing this, I don't think I physically went on tour with anyone that I wouldn't call a friend. And then slowly over time, all of a sudden it went from, touring with friends to touring with people I met touring to, you know, then four or five years in cold flying somewhere to go work for some people I've never met. Just through networking context, basically, right? Like the people you met. Very, very basic level networking, but still networking, I guess you could call it. This might just be me, but is cold flying a term everybody's going to know other than me? I know what it means. Like I inferred it, but that just means like flying somewhere to meet up with people you've never met before, right? Yeah. Or just, you know, coming in cold, cold open. Yeah. We should absolutely add that to the glossary. Cold flying, not referring to temperature of airplane. All flights are cold. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. I mean, that's a good start. I'm happy that We have you on then, Charlie, because that's the way me and Neil know getting into the music industry, you know, through networking and kind of your friends. And it's not like you're like, I'm going to work on tour. You were just like, this is what I like to do. This is what my friends are doing. And I'm just going to keep doing that. And I mean, I'm sure you wanted to go on tour, but I don't know. Like, did you, you said you started in audio. How long did it take for you? Or rather, what path career wise were you like? Did you go? I don't know. What did you do? I, I will say that the original goal wasn't really to tour at all. Yeah. I went... On my first few tours, just as a way to go with my friends out of town because they were going out of town to do shows, which was the same way I ended up on Scream the Prayer was my friend at the time, Matt Anderson, who now, you know, works with Dave Shapiro and books a bunch of different bands. He kind of on the same path of me 
just trying to find ways to stay with your friends doing things. He at the time had been booking shows in the city I grew up in. He had been managing bands like Death Star, Impending Doom, Sleeping Giant. And he was going out and had been tour managing for, you know, a year or two. He was going to go out on the Scream the Prayer tour and wanted someone to come out and stage manage for him uh, so he wouldn't have to be around all day. Asked me if I could do it. I said, I don't know what that is, but I can come out and do sound and I guess stage manage as well. It's funny how hardcore is that vehicle for so many people in the music industry. And it's such a small genre. Like, you know, like I remember going to hardcore shows and it was like the max a humongous show was like 300 people and like, like festivals would be like a thousand people. And you're like, this was the biggest show I've ever been to in my life. It was a thousand people. Everyone was moshing, but it's like, now it's like almost all the people I know in the music industry, maybe it's cause I'm from that side of things. They all come from hardcore. They all come from just wanting to be with their friends and touring. And it wasn't about touring in the beginning. It was about not missing out, not being able to go to the show, being able to travel with your friends and see different places just to be included and you figure out that niche that you can fit in and do really well. And that's like all of my friends that are still in the music industry, they were like, oh, I was really good at organization. So now they're like booking agents or I was like really good at organizing things and I was super patient. So now I'm a sound engineer or a producer or whatever. It's like, cause you have to have those things. And I was just like, uh, I can maybe play guitar. <laughs> It's just, it's funny how it works. It was never the the original goal. I mean, I had done a little bit of that, but while all of that was going on, I had assumed recording and making records was what I really wanted to do. So I had done a few like weekend trips with friends and I had done one like summer tour, but then I, you know, enrolled in, you know, a community college with a recording program. And I had started working at some studios around town at night, just like interning, went to school for like a year figured it would be cool to tour, but I'd rather do this. I moved to LA, started working in a few studios across town and thought that was what I wanted. Ended up doing the work, thought it was kind of miserable. Also, that was a time like that would be around like 2007, 2008. So I mean, it was about as dismal as it could be in LA for recording studios. To fund me doing that, I started working at nightclubs to like help pay rent. And then that was when I really started doing more and more live sound. I mean, I ended up taking a tour with Winds of Plague in the winter because the studio basically had nothing on the books for 60 days. So I figured, yeah, I'll go out for four weeks, pocket a little bit of cash to like help pay rent. And then I just never went back. I just kept touring. That's great. I think you touched on like something that Neil and I try to stress is that once you really get out there on tour, as long as you're not a bad person, you can kind of make it work from there with all the people you meet. And did you find that like once you got on tour, you're like, oh, I see how this works. I can kind of navigate this or. I don't know if I thought about it that way, but that that's definitely the way it played out. I mean, you kind of just you end up just jumping from either you're mixing a support band and on the next tour, you know, the headliner wants to hire someone new and all like they immediately start with like, oh, well, you know, who are we just out with? Or you're with a headliner and a year later, some support bands now doing bigger touring and they remember you. And it just it kind of just kind of keeps leapfrogging and molting from that. It's crazy how that is so important. Like you never really realize what opportunity is going to come tomorrow. But like you being that person every day that's like, well, I'm gonna go get her. I'm gonna go do this. I I don't know how I'm going to make it work, but I'm going to make it work. And other people just seeing that, they're like, we need that person around. You know, like we have this opportunity. Charlie definitely could do this for us. It's like you were never going out with the intention of like, I'm going to move to this band. And then with this next opportunity, I'm going to be doing this. It's like, I just need to make ends meet. This is what I'm good at. Oh, this opportunity came up and you were prepared to take advantage of those opportunities as they come because you were just doing it. You were doing what you loved. It wasn't like a it wasn't like a choice. It was more just like a necessity. It's pretty badass. Besides a few exceptions here and there, I mean, you could basically take everyone I've worked for in the last 10 years and just kind of draw a straight line through all of them. It all kind of just led to the next gig. It's another kind of testament too to how small this industry is and, you know, how many things are connected without even really being understanding that connection. You know, it just is the way it is. And it's another, it's so important to just always be trying to be on your best. Like you never know who talks to who and what good things could come around the next corner without even thinking about it. You know, it's, I wonder I'm still here. <laughs> 
you know, I keep cycling between this monitor tech, sound engineer. What do I call you? I feel like I'm messing it up every time. I, you can, I mean, you can call me a monitor guy. I mean, sound engineer works too. I mean, I mainly, when I'm doing sound, do monitors. Over the last, you know, five years, I've probably started, you know, PMing more than I've been doing sound, you know, so all of it's interchangeable. But it's been kind of like a gradual progression, right? Like you said, you started off being like, I don't know what stage managing is, but I can do sound and then you did sound and then you did monitors and now you're moving towards production management. Like you just, it's kind of like a progression, right? Everything started at, at me doing sound, which kind of just came from like recording really terrible demos for my friends, <laughs> you know? And then as I started just doing sound for friends bands, you know, as you end up as kind of the second person out there in the van after a merch guy, you know, over time when you're the one or two employees in theory in the van, it's kind of easy to start getting small tasks designating of like, okay, well, you know, why don't you hold the cash to like pay for gas? And are you cool with grabbing the check after the show? And then, you know, all of a sudden people are calling you a tour manager. Yeah. It's symbiotic in those small stages. Like everyone has to work together or else it doesn't succeed. Yeah. And it's, so it's, it's really easy to fall into like wearing multiple hats and it's, it's really easy to work your way up the ladder. Cause also too, you know, while I love doing just sound, you know, if you, after you're done doing sound can help load the trailer and go make sure you get paid, you know, all of a sudden you're a bit more valuable and you can ask to, you know, get paid a little bit more money. So when you turn around, it's like, yeah, I could do both of these jobs. If it means I can eat a little bit more, that's cool. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why not? I'm here. Yeah. That's how you learn in life in general. I feel like I'm like, most things I have found that I like doing or I'm good at is kind of by accident, just by being there and it needed to be done. And I'm like, oh, I kind of like doing this and I'm not so bad at this. And, you know, maybe I would like to do this. And then all of a sudden you have a new truck you built in your backyard and a restaurant. <laughs> It's crazy. I mean, it works like that with everything, though. So I, I think that that's like a super important thing as you move through this field, you know, this we're having you today on as you know, talking about the job as a monitor tech or monitor technician. And this is kind of our intermediate season. So the first one was beginner teaches people the jargon, how to kind of operate and touring. And this one is like, OK, now that you know you want to tour, now that you know what touring is, let's figure out a direction to head in. So like if you were to speak to somebody who's like just starting out, and they're thinking, hey, I want to get into touring. What skills would they, I guess, self-identify or notice that they are good at or have an interest in that would later lead them to, or at the moment, lead them to heading in the direction of being a monitor tech, if that makes sense? Do, do you know what I'm saying? Like, what can they be like, hey, I'm good at this. I should do that. You get asked this question all the time. How do you get into this? And sometimes it's hard to give an exact simple answer. If anyone that's out there listening that, you know, is doing some moderate amount of sound, even at a local or a church level, you have all the, the possibility in the world to, you know, get into touring. So your first step would be just keep doing your skill as much as you possibly can, you know? So in addition to, you know, mixing at your church, see, you know, if there's any local clubs, you can just come and help at. And even if you can't get a job mixing at these clubs, Try to be a stagehand. Try to, you know, help carry stuff in. And then when you're in those positions to be around people doing this job, try to watch as much as you can. It's really incredible how much you can learn by just watching. Even from just going to a concert and standing near the technical area where stuff's going on, just watching, you can learn a lot. And the majority of people, as long as you do it in a tactful and respectful way, most people are willing to uh, answer questions, you know, as long as you're talking to them at appropriate moments. Not during the show. <laughs> yeah, not during the show, but, you know, right as a show comes down, as walkout music's playing, it's a great moment to, you know, go up, hey, it show sounded great, and you can at least get one question in, you know. If you're helping load in a show at your local club, there's always a few hours of downtime once the initial gear is loaded in where you can walk up and slowly strike up a conversation. You won't learn much from those single situations, but over time, you'll definitely develop more knowledge than you had and have possible ways to start doing more. You also become recognizable. Yeah, 100%. Down the road, whenever an opportunity comes along, like, hey, this guy, we need an intern or we need someone to do this. Someone's like, what do you think about this guy? He's like, oh, he was really cool. He came up and asked me questions. Or the girl came up and asked me questions, talked to me about all these different 
subjects and they seemed really interested. It's like, there's not many industries where that's like an easy, direct line of communication with where you want to go. I feel like we can relate or people on tour can relate because we all remember being that person and we all, I feel like we learn in the same way where we just like to ask questions. We're just interested in things. So when somebody does the same thing to us, we're like, oh, now I can help them. Like, it's like a nice feeling. Yeah. And there's always moments in it. And especially if you stick with it, you know, especially if you're, if you start being a regular audio tech or a regular stagehand at a club or even a larger facility that's doing bigger tours, if crew boss or the local production manager knows you really like audio, he's going to make sure you're working with those people as they come in. And then, you know, also the, the other big path of, you know, people getting involved in this, if, if you're a smaller band on a bigger tour, you have unlimited access to be watching people work. One, you're supposed to be there, so they're not going to be annoyed by you. So, you know, if you're some guitar player in an opening band, you have the complete ability to hang around all day, watch what people are doing, hang around all night, strike up as many conversations as you want, help jump in. And there's tons and tons of people that have jumped in this world just from, you know, touring for a few years, finding aspects of the technical side of it that they're actually really good at. They can build a complete career just out of that. I remember that's what I was always jealous of Jaime from Pierce the Veil for doing that. Like he was always super interested in sound and I would always see him go out and stand during sound check or talk to the monitor guys. And, and I would always be like, I want to do that. And then I just, you know, never did that. But I would see him do that. And like now he like records bands and he has like this thing whenever, you know, the touring world goes down, he has this entire new way to express himself, to make income, to do all these different things because he really took that time and kind of put in that work whenever most people just wouldn't. That's great advice, I feel like. That was actually, I like all the stuff you just said, Charlie, because my questions are pretty generic or like, you know, they have to work with everybody. And I like the, the way you answered that and how you kind of you spoke to some things that not everybody who gets into touring experiences. You know, some people work for vendors and they went more of a, you know, school route or some people go all these different routes. And that's something that, you know, I don't even know if we talked about specifically how to actually do those things at venues, you know, and I feel like Charlie really summed it up well there. Yeah, that was good. And I'll never stop stressing, regardless of your personal beliefs on life, churches are a great place to get involved in learning technical and creative crafts. There's churches on every corner. The majority of them have live bands. The majority of them are doing multiple events a week. And regardless of your personal religious beliefs, you have complete access to go and work with live musicians at a lower amateur level that aren't going to be ex expecting you to know anything. A lot of times you can go and work at these places for free and develop a lot of skills. It's definitely not a bad place to start if you're not in urban environments where there's active nightclubs and music. Mm -hmm. And those are probably like a good middle ground too. Like the people there, they're all about community. I mean, that's what church is. And they want to help people. Like if anything, they're going to be very welcoming. And, you know, sometimes it's in the daytime. It's not like a nightclub with alcohol and smoke and fog. And, you know, it's a much more easy way to learn. It definitely lends itself to understanding. And My mom let me go because it was at church, you know? It was like way <laughs> easier to accept that, oh, you're going to a show on a Wednesday night. It's, oh, it's at a church. Okay, cool. The access to equipment and facilities at a church is a little bit more, it's a lot less restricted than a music venue. You know, a music venue is open when there's an event. It's typically not open when there's an event. And there's a lot of insurance and liability issues that prevent you from just going there whenever. Right. And messing around with equipment. Whereas with churches, if you build up a relation with these places, the majority of them, if you want to come and put time in on gear or fix stuff for them, you're not really going to be told no. I mean, and it's kind of a good lesson in life. It's like, even if these aren't your beliefs, you have to get used to doing that being on tour because you're around every different type of person. That's what touring is. Like you live with these people, you eat with these people, you sleep with these people, you hang out with these people on days off, getting used to being around things that maybe the thing that you're fully involved with in your own personal life and finding a way that, hey, this is awesome. I can definitely thrive in a place I never thought that I would be at. That's a great thing. It's super important, regardless if you feel like your views align with that or not. It's again, Charlie, incredible advice. Like I would never have thought to really push that avenue, but thinking back, that's how a day to remember got started. We didn't have venues. We had churches and we played tons of, if you're from the South, you play Legion halls, churches, you know, anything that would let us book a show when we were 
I grew up in the hardcore scene as well, like hardcore music in Wisconsin. Same thing. Just wherever they let us put some speakers down. Hardcore finds a way. Florida hardcore. I mean. Oh, yeah. Face down records. I mean. The majority of it was in church. Exactly. I mean, there's so many parallels between Southern California hardcore and Florida hardcore because it's all kind of Christian based. It's face down records. Like all those bands that. Well, we had Seven Star, which was Drew Russ, but he brought all those bands that were Christian hardcore bands. That's how I got into hardcore was Christian hardcore. I wasn't even a Christian at that time. I just was like, this is badass. I don't know what this is. I didn't know you were allowed to do this (laughs) at church. This is crazy. I mean, we had Under Oath. I'd like play Under Oath in my car with my mom and she'd be like, what the absolute hell is this? I'm like, he just said, Jesus, I love you, mom. You need to watch yourself. Okay. (laughs) Don't talk about him like that because this is Christian and you need to respect this. It's just crazy. I mean, you don't think that like most of these people, that's what this is in the music industry. It's if there's a will, there's a way you got to just go, you got to go do it. And it may feel uncomfortable, but it's going to be awesome. I promise that like most good things in my life have come because I forced myself to go and do something that wasn't exactly comfortable or wasn't exactly what I thought I aligned with. You make some of the best friends you're ever going to make by going out of your comfort zone and pushing into places that, well, it's, I would have never thought to do this. And it's also not a bad place to start, you know, honing some chops because there's, there's a lot of mistakes you can make mixing a church service or a youth group service that people either a aren't even going to notice <laughs> or B not care about that could easily get you fired from a club or a band in a second. Jesus is much more forgiving than <laughs> the Viper Room <laughs> or whatever, you know, it's like, I don't know. That's badass. I, I never even thought about that. Yeah, that's good. All right. There's a church like literally across the street from me here. So now I know concerts are happening right now. I'm going to go start shooting. <laughs> get the camera ready. Get in there. Sundays. It's going down. They're like, why is that guy here? There's seven of us here wearing masks. What is he taking pictures of? <laughs> You're like, I'm documenting this. Yes. I live around the corner. I'm here getting free experience. Thank you. Have a nice day. All right, Rad. Well, now that we know kind of how you got into this thing, let's get more into actually what you do on tour. And we're going to discuss, you know, a day in the life, walk everybody through a day, like give them an idea of like, okay, this is what it's like to be on tour. But if you could tell, like, I don't know, if you had a, somebody in the airplanes, like, what do you do at a show? If you could list off on a very basic level, the things you do throughout the day, what would they kind of be like? What are your responsibilities? If I had to break it down to the simplest building blocks on a basic day, I am doing all the sound on stage so performers can hear themselves. At the basic level is what I'm doing on the majority of the tours I'm on. On additional tours, when I'm holding other roles, I'm also you know facilitating the logistics of making sure gear and trucks arrive on time and that things actually get in the building. If I could describe my few jobs in the most basic terms. If you would go like one step deeper on facilitating the sound on stage for artists, is there any way to like explain the different things that go into that? Or would you rather do that through the... Like how does your day look like as load-in happens or when you get to the venue? Like, So on an average day, my day will depend a lot on whether I'm actively on tour or whether we're just doing a fly-in or a special event. If we're actively on tour and it's a band of a pretty professional level, I will typically be carrying all the equipment that we need for the band to perform from an audio aside. If it's a lower band or it's a fly date, we'll be using majority of local supplied gear. And my day changes a little bit drastically on those days because then it's it's a lot more time working with local people, making sure we're prepared for the night. Rather than like just setting up, you have to make sure you have the equipment to do what you need to do rather than being like, we know we have it. We just got to set it up. Where's the space we can do that? Exactly. So on, on a normal tour where I'd be carrying all of that, there's already been a sequence prior to the tour where we've rehearsed on the equipment. We've made sure it all works. Once we get through that sequence and we're actively on tour, it's mainly just a repetitive cycle every day. Gaining that consistency, coming into that like rhythm and finding how everyone kind of works together and how you can do it more efficiently and get thing, more things done before doors open rather than like kind of waiting till after and kind of scrambling and then kind of feeling comfortable as you go into the show and more confident, I guess. So on an average day, my mornings are spent watching how the rest of the load-ins coming along, depending on the size of production. 
when it gets to the point where we're ready to get backline and the band's equipment on stage, that's normally when I start setting up all of my own gear, whether I have wedges on stage or whether I have wireless equipment for bands that have in-ears. It's setting that up, making sure it's functioning and making sure it's all functioning along with all the band's equipment as well. So a decent part of the early part of the day is interfacing with all the backline technicians, making sure everything's working together. There's a period of the day where we test every single piece of the band's equipment, making sure it works with all of the audio equipment. So it's working not only on stage, but also out in the house. Once we run through uh, that area, which you'd call the line check, depending on the tour and the vibe of the band, there might be a sound check where the artist shows up, they play through the equipment, they're either cool or not cool, work through problems, get to a point where it's all thumbs up. Once that section of the day is done, Also, depending on the tour, it's working with all the opening acts, making sure they're taken care of either by myself or by a technician of my own or by local personnel. And then the rest of the day is just kind of checking back in on that show, making sure everything is still set up fine, making sure RF is still clean and clear. And it's just kind of a cycle of checking in on things until the show. In a perfect world, you're doing the exact same show every night. So it's just kind of trying to do the same thing you did last night or better. And then after the show, it's it's getting it all out and back into a truck. You don't just roll into a venue, plug in and just fucking wing it like that would never be the case. Like depending on traffic, sometimes you sometimes you end up winging it, but you hope to not. <laughs> I remember I remember like when I was younger, like I'm just like, do they just go in there and do it? Like, how do they know it works? But I guess like obviously doing it for so long now, I know that it's all it is, is creating systems and then redundantly checking them. It's almost becomes like an OCD kind of a thing where you're like, you mentioned RF earlier. That's like, you know, the radio frequencies. As you travel, those radio frequencies are crazy. Like in certain places, like you can, if you don't check them constantly, you can totally lose all sound through wireless equipment. So basically you're redundantly checking systems all day, every day. That's probably most of the job, right? Over the last five years, the RF side of my day has become either the biggest part of my day or a breeze. And it's all based on the city and what equipment we're carrying. And it seems like every few years, more of the available spectrum is sold off to private companies and bands are bringing out more wireless gear every tour. You know, every three to four months, it's a larger equation of will it work today? Will it not work today? A lot of times it's surprising. You set up, you go through the same process you do every day and it takes 10 minutes and everything's fine and everything works the rest of the day and it's no problem. Other days it can take you all day and you do everything you're supposed to do right and then there's still problems during the show. So this is not something that you could learn just by like, oh, you know, I really want to get into be a monitor tech. I'm really good at sound. These are things you have to learn by going out there. You know this because you've toured for 10 years and you've been to festivals where you check things 30 times and then you go to play and someone played right before you and stepped all over your frequencies. And now your whole show is kind of on the fritz as the intro is rolling and you're stuck just making things work, you know? It's kind of funny because it's also something that's not by definition anything that's sound at all. You could be a great mixer and you could get totally screwed and fired because of this telecommunications angle that you don't completely understand. Or you could have, you know, you're playing a casino and you've done everything right and everything's fine. And all of a sudden at, you know, 945, the piano singer of some bar, you know, flips on one mic and, you know, the whole show goes down. (laughs) <laughs> this sounds uh, very specific, like you may have experienced this exact situation before. <laughs> All right, cool. So before we get into more specifically what you do during the day, uh, a lot of our listeners, myself included up till like a week ago, didn't fully understand what a monitor tech does in depth. Do you think you could, I know you said like, hey, you know, they, you know, they make sure the artist while they're playing can hear themselves or hear their own music. Can you explain like how that works and what the purpose is behind that? So uh, people just understand how important your job is. Yeah. So at the basic level, a monitor guy or a front of house guy is a sound engineer. His bands start growing in size, even as small as playing to 100 or 200 people. It's not out of the ordinary for a band to bring out a sound guy to mix them and make them sound good in front of the crowd. And over time, as that band grows, it starts to be really hard for one guy to do that job. Even when you move into six, 800 capacity clubs, you'll end up with two different sound engineers for one show. 
One guy mixes the sound out in the house. Another guy mixes the sound on stage. And over time, bands will decide to bring a monitor person out instead of using someone that's locally supplied. So when you hear people throw around terms like monitor mixer, monitor guy, monitor technician, they're talking about the guy that's dedicated for just doing sound for the band or the artist. And you kind of stand on stage, right? You stand off to the side, stage left or stage right, and you you do your thing from there. Yeah, because before the band can play in unison with each other for the guy mixing them out in the house, they have to be able to hear themselves. And over time, as you're playing different places, it actually gets more and more difficult to hear what you're doing, not only yourself, but what everyone else is doing. And especially as you play more challenging venues as they get bigger and bigger, it's not completely insane to be standing on stage and not hear a single thing, whether it's your own instrument or what the other person's doing. So what that monitor person is doing is simply providing sound to you either through a speaker or through in-ears so you can physically hear what you're doing and you can physically hear what everyone else is doing so you guys can all play together. That at the heart is what a monitor person does. Sounds important. I mean, it's also very important to have your own monitor guy. And like you kind of said, you know, you can on a lower level, you're able to kind of go around and maybe this the main front of house engineer can do that a little bit. But most of the time it's like house guys. And there is like, God bless everyone trying to come up and learning in the house. But it is really hard to understand all the small intricacies that an artist needs when you just met them 15 minutes before. And they said in three minutes, I need my guitar, those drums, his vocal, all really loud right here. And and expect someone else that doesn't even know that person what that means, because it's all based on knowing the person and being able to work with someone. So like having someone that an artist can trust is everything. Having a sound engineer that I can look over and know I'm like, hey, guitar up. They know what that means. They're not going to blow my head off or or I can look over without even saying anything. Because when you're playing, you have to, it's all about trust. When you're on stage in these big venues, the PA faces forward. And I know a lot of times everyone's like, it's super loud. How can you not hear it? But behind the PA, you hear nothing. Like on stage, you hear literally nothing. It's really weird. It's like symbols, maybe. Symbols in a snare drum. The monitor guy is one of the most important people as far as trust goes, as far as being able to do what you do as an artist. I could not, I, in my mind, as a person touring, that would be like one of the first people that I'm like, hey, we need to spend our money on this. Especially with your running in-ears. In-ears are basically your monitors that are on stage that are super loud. They're for going in your ears. They protect your hearing. So having someone that can like take that into consideration of what you need is super important because you don't get any bleed. You hear nothing outside of your ears. So not being able to have that monitor guy that you can trust or that monitor girl that you can trust, you're kind of lost. You're kind of going in blind. You can't hear anything. You don't know what's going on. It's way hard to play in unison when you are just out there wandering around listening to cymbals and a snare drum. I feel like I've seen more monitor techs get yelled at than any other job. How do you deal with that, Charlie? How do you deal with like kind of... It it looks a little more intense than it is. I mean, there are people that, you know, are a little ruthless and fly off the handle for no reason. But I find those people are actually more few and far in between than your average artist. You know, a, a good skill to learn if you're trying to do more monitors than anything else is you kind of got to jump into this mindset of being a finless. I don't know what that word means. What'd you say? Just being a finless. Like you can't be offended. You have oh, thick skin. It's not personal. Yeah. And also the, the, the yelling stuff sometimes isn't as intense as it looks. You got to remember there's a show going on. Everything's loud. You can't hear anything. If you're to the point of walking across stage and talking to the monitor guy, whatever you're asking for has to be super important and you need it fast. And just like in any intense, passionate exchange with people, it's always going to come out loud and fast and aggressive because in the moment you feel like whatever you're asking for is dire. It's an emergency is the way most people feel when they're making monitor changes. So a lot of it has to do with the intensity of it and the dramatics of it kind of start to fade on you at a adrenaline level after you do it even just a little bit especially after you do it for you know quite some years when you're standing there in the moment, it doesn't feel as intense as the people standing watching whoever's getting yelled at get yelled at. You're like making mental notes. He's like, snare, louder, fuck you. You're like, yes, okay, I got you. Perfect, no problem. See you later. It is, I mean, how was that something that you learned quickly? I, I know you kind of like mentioned that you gained it that very easily or was that something that like over time like people helped you with? I don't ever remember 
emotionally struggling with it. Like I never remember like walking away from a job going, man, like I just wish they'd be nicer to me. I think it's something that just, you know, as you were going to shows and you're part of working shows, it's just, it's just kind of a nature of what it is. Touring world, you got to be able to just take it sometimes, I guess you'd say. Yeah. And I don't know. If, I don't know if it's that unordinary. I mean, Neil, you run a restaurant now. I mean, I don't know if the conversations that are had on stage are any different from the conversations that happen in a kitchen or, you know, yeah. any high intensity, fast paced work, I, I think all kind of takes the same line. Just being able to to take those things in the moment and understand that it's not personal. You know, you're all there with the same common goal of kind of making sure that the show goes on and having the best experience and you are working together. Ah, you're right. There's so many parallels between all these different industries where it is high intensity, where you're like yelling, you're like 86 that we need this heard that, you know, like everybody's on the same page and on the same team. I think that everybody has an understanding that, hey, we're just trying to reach this goal together. But, you know, we have a, a discord where like people can talk about the podcast and stuff. And somebody last week asked for advice. They're like, hey, I'm shooting on a on a movie set. And somebody on the set is being so hard on me. And they explained everything. And I read through it. And I was like, honestly, this just seems like they're a crew person. Like that is you're just experiencing crew talk. Like people can be very blunt. It's just because they want to get something done. It's not because they're trying to be mean. Well, I've also noticed, too, that like when people are sometimes more harsh, it means that they want to see you succeed. Yeah. I know a lot of times where I don't give a fuck. I don't say anything, you know, like if it doesn't matter to me one way or the other. And like not saying that's the way to be. I'm just saying this the way it is, you know, and you're giving someone harsh criticism. Sometimes you want to see them get better to see them succeed. They care about you. It's a weird way to show it, but they do. It is. And a lot of times people need to understand that the music world and the touring world is a rough business and it has been much more rough in the past. Like these are like legit pirate people that have been hazed, brought into this business under tough conditions. They have tough skin. They talk to people in a certain way and they don't mean anything bad by it, but it's sometimes it's a lot. And I think that being reminded that, hey, a lot of times whenever people are giving you these harsh criticisms or talking to you in a certain way, it's because they want to see you succeed and they want to see you get better and not get out of there. And if they ignored you and you kept doing something wrong, you're done. You lose the job. You move on. Yeah, I would never want to encourage bad behavior. And I, I always like in everything I've done, I've, I've always found it's easier to get things with a smile and being polite than it is, you know, being aggressive. But at the same time, from a creative collaboration perspective, I find I get more done with artists and creative types when they are very blunt and direct about what they want, whether that comes out harsh or aggressive or not, than more passive guarded people. I find those days and those jobs to be the hardest. I will take an artist screaming at me, this snare sounds like shit, or you need to do something about this goddamn guitar any day over the artist that's, yeah, it sounds fine. Because one, you know, it doesn't sound fine. And you got to ask a million questions to pull the answer out of them. Whereas the artist standing there screaming about what they don't like, even if it's aggressive, at least, you know, okay, I got to do something to that guitar because that's what they're mad about. If I can know what they're mad about faster, I can work on it more than having to do this five, 10 minute thing of, does that sound better? How about this? I don't mind super blunt artists. If, if you're going to tell me something direct and immediate, I'll take that in whatever way you want to wrap it up. Again, I think that that's awesome information too, because people getting into that line of work might be discouraged by those types of interactions when really it's so much easier. You're getting so much more done so much more quickly. And this all is a game of numbers, like getting things done in an amount of time. Like you only have so much time in a day. You only have so much time before doors. You only have so much time before it's your set. Every single day, there's still the same number of tasks, regardless of new things come up, regardless of problems, you still only have the same amount of time. Yeah, I think that's great advice. Again, Charlie, Brad. I think passion is just always going to be a side effect of creativity. So I, I think in any creative environment where multiple people are working, you're going to have some passionate and dramatic displays. And those aren't always what you would say are nice or pretty. Well, they're also artists too, you know, yeah. like they're, I know personally, I'm not the best at communicating. <laughs> I, I learned to play guitar, so I didn't have to use words. You know what I mean? It's like guitar, shit, sound, probably the most you're going to get out of me when I'm like frustrated. <laughs> you know, It's like, fuck. And then other people are much more eloquent. Speaking of what Neil said, there is a lot of stuff to do in the day. So yeah, we wake up in the morning, Charlie, you're in your bunk, you get up, 
what goes through what's like the first thing you do what's on your mind besides think of me so normally and recently since I never really know how time involved my day is going to be. And since my days are typically later and later every year, I try for mental health, I try to get up at least two or three hours before work is about to begin. And at least for the job I do, the morning is when I choose to leave the bus, go away from the venue. And I typically try to find some way to do an hour walk to coffee. Maybe I'll grab a book. Maybe I won't. So the mornings I really try to set aside for myself. I know a lot of people typically do this later in the day, but I'll normally always take the mornings to get away from work and kind of have that be my off time. We're all about mental health. Yeah. Whenever I know whatever a load in time is going to be, I'll typically try to wake up two or three hours before that and get away for a bit. All right. It's huge. Mental health is huge. Self-care on tour is huge. It's been a topic of conversation a lot lately, but it's so rad that it is because it's something that is really hard to maintain when you're out there. It's easy to kind of like give to everyone else. Taking time for yourself is super important. Yeah. And I mean, there, there's nothing wrong with waking up and rolling into work. And it, it's the way the majority of people do it. And there's nothing wrong with it at all. And I even end up doing it a lot of the times just because the schedules get exhausting. But sometimes that misery that some people have on them for the first hour of the day or the grogginess. I, I try to get that out of my system away from like colleagues and, you know, people that I'm meeting and working with for the first time. Yeah. You want to make a good impression. So you, you basically wake up two, three hours by yourself and you like what head into load in. I'll normally time my day. So I'll take off from the bus or if I'm waking up in a hotel, I'll see if there's any way for me to walk to the venue instead of riding in the bus. And I'll typically plan a walk around a coffee shop or maybe a breakfast spot. So on a, you know, if you're talking about an average small two bus tour, load ins will typically be anywhere from like 11 to noon, sometimes a bit later. I'll always try to show up maybe 20 to 30 minutes before the expected time for us to load in just to most venues are normally open an hour before anything goes on. So it's, it's never a bad idea to get inside, look around without anyone asking you questions. You can kind of get a quick lay of the land to figure out where you'll probably be putting gear, at least have an idea before gear starts rolling in. Normally, this is a great time to meet the people you're going to work with, have small conversations. If it's local people you've worked with before, sometimes just two minutes of small talk will change the complete their complete day and the way they relate with you. So it's not a bad thing to get out of the way before you physically start working. And then whenever load in begins, pretty simple. Gear starts rolling in and you start figuring out where it goes. It's like a game of chess. <laughs> Figure out there's like four square foot of space and you have to fit an entire trail semi trailer's worth of gear in it, you know, and I always like wonder we like roll in there like how did we put all of this gear in here last time? <laughs> Where did it go? <laughs> you walk in there beforehand and you're like this all goes in there? <laughs> Somehow it does. I don't understand that. Yeah, so you load it in, you set it up. What do you need to prepare for the day? So it, it can range from me bringing in all the equipment it would take to do a show to as small as me just bringing in a mic package to put on the band's gear and I'm using all local provided gear. So it all depends on the, the scope of the tour. On a 1,000 to 2,000 cap tour, there's a good chance that I'm carrying a small console and a small audio package to supplement the band's equipment. So that could range from me bringing in a small in-ear package, a console to mix the band's ears on, and a range of microphones and cables. So it's slowly having that set up to the side waiting to go as the band sets up their gear. And I slowly follow behind putting microphones on things, cabling things up, making sure that everything's coming up on the right channels on my console. And as people start making noise with certain pieces of gear, I make sure I'm seeing it and then it's working. So the console is the thing with all the knobs and all the lights and all the thing that's like super overwhelming. If you've never kind of been up on the stage before, you're like never stand in front of Charlie on stage, right? It depends. You're you're Adam, you're one of the few people I've never actually been bothered by, mainly because you never actually stand in front of me. He's stealthy. <laughs> but even when you do, you're, you're there for a second and then you're gone, you know? <laughs> well, I mean, like if you're at a show and you're trying to learn something, just know that like there is a real reason you're on stage able to see the band, right? Always look at the ground. And if there's an X made out of tape, probably shouldn't be there. <laughs> 
for a good reason, you know, and it's never like just like a suggestion for no reason. It's like there's something above here that could probably fall and kill you. Uh, you're going to block someone who might also kill you. Uh, you're going to stand on something that could fall off and then you could die on your own. It's a death trap in there, man. You just got to watch out for those X's. I'm happy that I've never uh, bothered you. That makes me proud. But Adam, you've always followed the first good rule about photographers. Is you're always moving. It's hard for people to notice or even complain about you being somewhere if you're not there for more than a few seconds. It's like, who's that guy? I don't know. He's leaving now. It doesn't matter. You know what I mean? <laughs> so He's not my problem anymore. Yeah. I never thought about it that way. Adam, I don't know if I've ever watched you stand somewhere for minutes at a time taking photos. It's you, you show up, crank a few, look at your camera once or twice, and then there he goes, you know, <laughs> wherever he's going. I don't know. He's going there next. <laughs> hey, fair enough. I appreciate it. I never thought about that. I never thought about that either. And I'm the one doing it. So it must come from a level of instinct. When you're on tours with Adam, when you when you have that Dropbox to look through in the morning, it is funny to look at it and it you see photos from every angle of the room even sometimes the <laughs> ceiling you're like this show is just an hour how did this guy get around this whole place i always wonder that too i'm like how does he get up to those places like and then he's back back down i know when the certain songs are too i'm like that happened in this song and then this photo is from that next song on the roof <laughs> how does he do it well thanks guys well i appreciate it that's very kind of you guys all right so you set everything up the next big part of your day is sound check slash line check what are you doing during that time so in line check you're basically just checking to make sure everything is actually working so you know i'm making sure every microphone is seen signal i'm checking every radio frequency i've set for the day and just making sure they're functioning and working and seeing some level during sound check i'm going a step further and making sure everything sounds right slash good or at least sounds the way it did the night before that makes sense it's funny because it's like you're saying this and all of this is like well oh yeah that, that happens but then like actually thinking about it, it's like it is not just a given and i never i mean I, I guess we've just done it for so long that it just seems like oh yeah that's what we do. we're talking about the things we do that we don't know we do i was so happy when neil asked what a council was i was like oh that's good or console am i saying it wrong I always like whenever I would like look up there, I would be the most intimidated by those things. Cause I'm just like, I don't even know how you begin to learn how to work those. It's there's so many knobs and thing. It's just the same thing over and over and over again. <laughs> it's like, do you have a degree in physics and understand the inner workings of the universe quicker than learning to use a console? I mean, it is fun to break things down to these like simple, simple levels, because I mean, Given the scenario, sometimes things are really complicated and it's really involved like what you're doing. But at the end of the day, what you're doing is very simple when you talk about it like this. And it's much harder than it seems. Charlie's <laughs> just a professional. So sound check completes, band likes all their stuff. We're good to go. I have down that the next thing you kind of do is meet up with the band before the show. Is there anything that happens like during doors or whatever? Or are you just mostly double, triple checking everything? A lot of just double and triple checks. Okay. This is typically the, the area of the day where most people in most positions will try to get away for a little while. I find with the way... I work and what I do, it's just easier to hang around. I typically use this time of the day to do any type of preventative maintenance or repairs on stuff that I can. Obviously, you're not doing anything to anything on stage, but anything I've set aside that wasn't working or anything I've been trying to do that haven't had time, this is typically a nice time for me to do it because normally no one's in the room or barely anyone's in the room. So I'll use this time to fix some things, check in on RF. You know, this is the time where I'll normally troubleshoot. With RF, you always want to have a bunch of backup frequencies ready to go. So this is normally the time where I'll search for those. I've already gotten frequencies working for the show, but now that we're in a close amount of time to the show, to you know, I can expect things to be working, I can now go ahead and work on, okay, what things can I use if I have an oh shit moment? So that's kind of the part of the day where I'll, I'll get ready for, you know, any surprises that could come up. This is the part of the day, too, where you're not really making a ton of noise. So it's like you're not out there fucking banging on the drums. It's like an hour before doors. It's usually pretty quiet. Yeah. You usually have like, you know, the house music playing. And this is the time for people to kind of fix those things that they really need to focus. I never knew that until I started playing my guitar super loud and they yelled at me and said, now it's time to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> it's not time to do this, Neil. 
I'm going to try to write a song really quick on guitar and play the same riff 800 times <laughs> while everyone else is trying to concentrate and they all hate me. So know exactly what day you're talking about in California. And I hate, I do hate you. Before the show, show, what all do you have to do? I guess is the, the most basic way to ask that. It varies from, from tour to tour. There's normally, you know, a ritual of the way you'll clean things and the way you'll prepare things for the night. You know, I, I know Adam, uh, the guy that's currently doing monitors for a day to remember, he's got a perfect way he lays out all of his packs and the band's picks and all these things, you know. What are packs? Uh, like the inner packs that the band wears. This is a wireless thing, basically. The thing that is screwed up by RF, because that's the running theme. Typically before the show, you're doing all the small rituals you do for everything to be ready for the show. Depending on the band, sometimes you'll have conversations before the show. Sometimes you won't. Sometimes the first time you see them will be right when they walk on stage. Could be nerve wracking to me. I mean, obviously I'm on the other side of it. And to me, I'm like, oh yeah. This is... <laughs> but thinking about it from you, I'm getting a little bit of anxiety. I'm like, oh, really? I prefer to have a little bit more communication with the band right before the show goes off. You don't always get that luxury, but you always hope for a little, you know, minute, two minute window before the band walks where they can actually have their instruments in hand. They can have their in-ears in and on. Typically with a good uh, stage manager or production manager, you know, there'll be a moment where, you know, kind of gather the band's attention to, hey, are you good? Can you hear everything? Can you hear stuff in your ears? You'll get a thumbs up from, you know, all members and then there'll be a show call. That's great because if something's not working, you got a minute or two to make it work. Sometimes you don't get that luxury and you just hear go for show and you just kind of stand there the whole time hoping it all works, you know? I know some of my favorite times in the world are like when all of the instruments are working in the in-ears, but they're not on front of house. And like <laughs> someone's something is like, oh, my bass guitar is not working. It's like two minutes to show, intro's rolling. Oh, my bass guitar is not working. And then just like looking over, <laughs> everyone turning at the same time, looking directly at like whoever's doing monitors and they're just like, fuck. <laughs> You have to rely on the redundancy. You have to rely on the ability of doing it so many times, understanding your rig so well that you can troubleshoot in those small moments of time. It's got to be terrifying. Even after doing all those small checks and, you know, whatever ritual you do to make sure, you know, you feel ready for show, there's still always is that fun moment when the lights go down, the intro rolls, the band comes out and does whatever they do right before the first word is sang into a microphone that you're just kind of on edge till you hear that first word and you go, okay, everything's working. We can go. And it gets worse on tours when that time is longer than just like 30 seconds. Cause you'll do, you'll do some shows where it's a long drawn out, like they're out there for a minute before the first word sang. And you're like, man, this is going to be a bummer if you just to say something into this mic and it doesn't work. House party tour. <laughs> <laughs> had that whole intro video for like three minutes. <laughs> yeah, so now to the most nerve-wracking slash part of the show that you've prepared for the whole day, the show. I know people know that, hey, you're doing monitors, but what is that like during live show? Like, what does that involve? What do you have to do during the show? It varies from band to band. You do some tours where as long as everything sounds the way it did at Soundcheck, you're just standing there watching the show for an hour. Then there's other ones where it's way more involved, you know, especially with digital consoles and the ability to have playback tracks and the ability to automate. You can have some shows where you're doing a million different changes throughout the show on every song, on every part of the song. On those tours, you're pretty much locked in like you're playing a video game and you're just you're watching your cue list and you're getting ready for the next thing and you're just kind of like a robot, you're going through all the cues. You're doing the dance. Yeah, you're doing the dance. I find those shows to actually be a lot more, the show doesn't feel as long because since you're doing something every moment, it flies by like that. That's one aspect of it, doing what you're supposed to do. And then the other aspect of it is just being, being ready for whatever problems can come up. And then that's where there's not much advice I can give to people. That's where doing a hundred to a thousand shows yeah. comes into play because you start to learn everything that can go wrong. You start being ready to know, okay, if this happens, I'm going to do that. You know, like I through you know, all the data remember tours I did, 
I can tell you anytime Jeremy would go in the ball, I would all of a sudden have, or I'd have an in-ear pack synced up to his channel, ready to go if he came back up missing that. And I'd have a spare microphone waiting in case he didn't come back with it. What's go in the ball mean for the listeners who don't know what that means? I'll let Neil answer that one. (laughs) It's like the hamster ball, you know, like when, uh, when our amazing singer runs across the crowd in a little, I mean, now in, in COVID times, it's like, we look like we were fucking psychics, you know, we were ahead of the time. We knew what was fucking coming. We're, we've been practicing. Jeremy wears that now all the time. I saw him yesterday. I couldn't even get anywhere near me. I had a, had a ball on. You can't learn those things without going and, and having that real world experience. That's why it's so important. Get in there. Like you said, you went out on tour and you were like, I'm a stage manager, but I don't know what that is. And that's just you getting that experience. That's you going and doing it and learning. And a lot of this is, I'm not trying to knock traditional schooling or anything like that. You can go and listen to someone talk about something, but doing it in practice and seeing and understanding the concepts in real life, in time, there's no better way to understanding things than to do that, to really utilize them in real life. And it's like, you can't do that unless you're out out there doing it. You can listen to this podcast for the rest of your life. And then you go out and you do like three or four shows utilizing the concepts that are talked about this. And you will understand them on a level that you never could just sitting at home, understanding and listening to this stuff, you know? Yeah. So, you know, there's a few terms in there that I don't know if you'd be willing to give a quick explanation of what they are. I know they're probably pretty normal to you, but what's a playback track? Uh, so a playback track is a uh taking tracks of pre-recorded music and putting them on a laptop or an iPod. And it's uh, music the band would play to, thus supplementing their sound, if that makes sense. As a group with five players, if you have 17 tracks that make up a song, you can only do five things at one time. No, it's important. So the show's over, band's off stage. You, I'm assuming you retrieve the in-ears and the packs. What do you do then for loadout and after show? Like, I don't know if you just want to walk us through those things. What's your life like? I will be one of the first people to say my entire day is about the out. I live to just end the day. So, you know, the second that show comes down, everything's calculated to get out of the building as fast as possible. So typically that's the day where I'm actually sweating or that's the point in the day where I'm actually sweating and you're literally just packing up everything you just did as fast as you can and getting it out of the building as quick and as efficiently as you can. And then I know you have like a morning routine. Do you have a nighttime routine? Like what do you like to do at the end of the night? My end of the night routine is probably more mellow than the average. Normally after I'll pack up a show, I'm a nighttime shower guy. So that's normally the first thing on my mind is where's a shower. And then depending on where I'm at, If there's some really cool food spot in town, that's my next mission is finding food. If there's not anywhere cool, my next mission is how fast can I go to sleep? (laughs) I like that. I like sleep. I like food. Well, first of all, thank you for sharing your everything you just shared with us. That was awesome. Yeah, I appreciate that people would have any care of hearing it. We can all steal your job now, right? That's all it takes is listening to you talk once. <laughs> <laughs> we This season, is the theme is kind of never miss bus call. The first season, well, the whole podcast is don't shit on the bus, but we really started the first season. This one's never miss bus call because we feel like that's a really important rule. But have you ever missed bus call? I have never missed a bus call. I have gotten left before. <laughs> But in situations where the bus leaves before it's supposed to, in some random warp tour ways. Have you ever run to a bus carrying palm frites in Belgium? Actually, yes, we, we have. But that's always been one of my exceptions to the rule. I will never purposely miss bus call. But if I see a principal or someone that's paying for that bus walking somewhere else, I'll go with them, no problem, because I'm going to assume the bus isn't going to leave without them. Yeah, if you're with the band member, you're good to go, right? I do remember that moment in Belgium with Neil walking away with a minute to go to go get French fries. I think it was, uh, that was probably the Every Time I Die Mm -hmm. Uh, story so far. Yep. Neil wanted fries, so I wasn't really worried about the bus leaving. I knew it wasn't, so I was like, hey, if he's going, I'll go, no problem. (laughs) I think that was when I was like vegan and the importance of French fries to a vegan. They're everything. You'll get left in Belgium to go get some world's best French fries. I know how important it is. It's like when you're on tour and there's a chance to get like something that's really good food wise and you're on a limited restricted diet, you're going to take most chances to go and do that. I mean, not getting left is super important. It does lose its potency a bit, though, as you get older and especially as you're like 
making like legitimate money doing it, it, it kind of falls in the category of like, well, I can get myself there. How important is what I'm wanting to get? Yeah, there, there you go. You know what I mean? <laughs> All right, cool. I mean, before we end this, Charlie, is there any, this is the most basic question that I feel like everybody hates, but like for somebody going out there who's like, likes audio and they want to do this, do you have any tips, tricks, rules, anything that you swear by? They're like, this will help you so much if you just know it now. No pressure. If I could give any tips, knowing your frequencies, like audible frequencies is the best thing you can have, whether you're doing front of house or whether you're doing monitors. I think I sent you a link to a resource where you can just listen to different sine waves. Yeah, it's like a little game thing. We'll put it in the blog. So don't shut on the bus.com or check out the episode blog for this. We'll have a link in there for you. That's a great resource because you, you can download any type of sine wave generator and pick frequencies and listen to them. That game is cool because it, it just gives you random ones and you have to guess. And believe it or not, it does eventually start working over time. You start to actually memorize these sounds. This is like your language. As you're listening to things, it uh, it helps you troubleshoot real fast, like where this sound is coming from, whether it's feedback or a guitar sounding weird or a vocal sounding boxy. It'll, it'll help you learn to locate what's wrong. Won't exactly teach you how to fix things, but you at least won't just be staring at a bunch of knobs going, uh, I don't know where to start. What does that sound? I always thought you were a wizard when you just knew. I'm like, why does the snare drum sound like a fart? And you're just like, Shh. and I'm like, oh shit, that was so quick. I love it. Another thing that's as dead simple as it sounds, you know, for anyone starting out, you know, definitely spend a little bit of money on good headphones or in-ears if you can and just you know take an hour every day if you can and actually actively listen to music not for the sake of listening to melodies and singing along but actually listening to the sonic quality of what you're listening to and over time as you add those things up you can start to relate what things are supposed to sound like especially as trends change over and over again it's really easy as you get older to kind of lose track of the way things are supposed to sound like you know especially like you know neil if you remember like how many times would you go into clubs as a younger musician and all of a sudden the drums were just these dull thumpy things because no one had really listened to how shiny drums were sounding in modern music Absolutely. I mean, all the time. Those same trends happen over time. And it's really important to actively listen to, you know, what's current so you can kind of keep a keep a thumb on the pulse of, you know, what you're mixing, what it's actually supposed to sound like. It's like because you could be the best in the world. And if you don't understand how to utilize those things, what is happening currently, you you look like a dinosaur or you look like you don't know what's going on or people are not going to like vibe with your style. It's like, but if you're well-rounded or versed in all of it. Absolutely. And, and not even the sense of current music, which is important, but also, you know, if you're if you're coming up and you're working in nightclubs and you have a reggae band one night and you have, you know, some pop cover band the next night, you're going to have to learn how to mix things differently. Not every bass is going to sound the same and not every vocal is going to want the same type of effect. So your ability to know this is what this is supposed to sound like will be really, really important for, you know, you making the people on stage happy. Hell yeah. And then, you know, through time, you'll you'll know as you're looking at what you're supposed to be doing that night, like, hey, we got some rockabilly bands playing tonight. I need to have a slap delay ready to throw into the monitors because they're not going to play without it. And, you know, every genre of music has those things that are must. Like just being prepared in those things. It's like you knowing those things saves you. It is your you leaning on that experience. Yeah. They're like that guy knew to put that on this thing. And we've hired people because they've taken the time to do research beforehand, like understanding what was needed just because they took the time to listen or understanding where we're coming from. It may not even seem like logical a lot of times. It's just the way that it is. Someone a lot of times does things that are not for any other reason than a style. Like it may even seem like wrong, but it is correct to those people. And if you get that right, you make a friend for life. 100%. Neil, hit him with the most important question ever. You don't wear shower shoes, do you? You, you don't do that, right? No. Too brave, you know? Yeah, I, I you know. I got kids to feed. I like to uh, strengthen my immune system through the bottoms of my feet. <laughs>
That's where everything starts. That's our connection to this planet. It's how we stay grounded. Well, thank you, Charlie, for joining us today. I appreciate you. We appreciate your time. We do. Thank you so much. Yeah, Charlie. So many points that you brought up in this were things that I would have never thought about that are paramount. Really just eye-opening to someone that has talked about this already for 10 episodes. And just to think that there's so many more perspectives to go in depth into this topic. It's kind of rad. Thank you. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for having me on. We'll see you again soon on tour, hopefully, eventually. Hopefully. (laughs) At some point. (laughs) Hopefully. All right. Well, can you say, take it away, Kevin? Take it away, Kevin Scaff. (laughs) 